Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. Um, we're really happy that you could make it tonight for this presentation. Um, so I will get started with a brief introduction of our presenter. This is Jeremy Dontremont. He is the author of more than 20 books and hundreds of articles on lighthouses and maritime history. He is the historian and president of the American Lighthouse Foundation, founder of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, and historian for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. He has lectured and narrated cruises throughout New England, and he hosts the U.S. Lighthouse Society's weekly podcast, Lighthearted. Jeremy emphasizes the rich human history of lighthouse keepers and their families in his presentation. So we're really looking forward to this tonight. Um, I'll be sure to put some resources in the chat um, and answer any questions. And I know that Jeremy will also be kind of monitoring the chat as well. So please feel free to use that during the presentation for your questions. And we'll see if we have a little bit of time at the end as well to answer any questions um, there. So without further ado, I think I'll pass it over to Jeremy. Thank you so much, Gianna. Thank you all for being here tonight. I see some familiar names. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, somebody posted in the chat just a minute ago, great Fresnel lens. The picture behind me, uh, and I'm not really in a lighthouse. And that's, that's the illusion I'm creating here, but uh, that is the lens at Boston Light. And Boston Light is the lighthouse I talk about more than any other in my presentation. So I thought that would be a nice background. So let me go ahead into screen sharing here. And just bear with me for a moment. And I'm going to try to get rid of these floating controls at the top of the screen because they're a little bit in the way. And all right, so here we go. Uh, so I've got a lot of ground to cover. I don't want to do a long introduction here, but I, I will just say that I've been doing Lighthouse stuff for a long time, really since the mid 1980s. And uh, I grew up in Lynn, Massachusetts, and uh, of course on the North Shore of Boston, and uh, always loved the ocean. Uh, and uh, was largely the uh, late historian Edward Rowe Snow, who was uh, responsible for my my love of uh, maritime history and lighthouses. And I am going to talk about him a little bit in the presentation. Uh, but for me, what really captivated me, in addition to the photographic beauty of lighthouses, the, how uh, photogenic they are, I also fell in love with the history, the human history, the stories of lighthouse keepers and their families and how devoted they were to these places. And it is a way of life that is dying out now with the automation of the lighthouses. So uh, with that said, let me just give you a, a few more basics here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, people ask me sometimes, uh, what were lighthouses built for? I, and I realize that not everybody knows uh, why lighthouses are there in the first place. I always like to say they're signposts on the sea. Uh, you know, if you're driving down the, the road, a road or highway in your car, you see signs that tell you where you are and where you're going. Lighthouses basically serve the same purpose on our waterways and not just in the ocean. We have lighthouses on fresh water as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have hundreds of lighthouses on the Great Lakes. A uh, little side note is that the state of Michigan has more lighthouses than any other state with about 120. Uh, but uh, lighthouses basically tell mariners uh, where they are, where they're going. Uh, they recognize the flash or col and or color of a, a light, see it on their nautical charts. Uh, on their light lists. And by recognizing the characteristics of the lighthouses, uh, they can tell their own position, basically. So there's a lot more to the science of navigation, but that's the basics of why lighthouses are there. And most of them at the beginning were uh, established to mark the entr entrances to harbors and bays. As time went on, a lot of them were established to mark dangerous areas, so mariners would know to uh, avoid those areas. And many lighthouses actually serve both as welcome and warning. There are approximately 850 standing lighthouses in the US, give or take a few. It depends on how you count them, what your definition of a lighthouse is. Uh, and there are more than 20,000 in the world. And of the ones in the United States, about two thirds of them, that's uh, and pro it's probably a little bit less than that. I think it's between half and two thirds uh, of the lighthouses are still active federal aids to navigation. Uh, all of those, the ones that are still active, all of them are now automated. So the ones that are federal aids to navigation still, the lights themselves are maintained by the Coast Guard. There are Coast Guard aids to navigation teams that go out periodically and service these lights. 
but the Coast Guard has been getting out of the business uh, for quite a while of taking care of the structures. Uh, and uh, basically all our lighthouses were automated by 1990 with one exception that I'll be talking about. Uh, but with the automation of lighthouses and the removal of keepers, the traditional keepers who lived at them for so many years, uh, traditional lighthouse keeping is fading into the past. And as I said, the Coast Guard is getting out of the business of taking care of the structures. The lighthouse structures themselves are being, uh, in some cases, licensed or leased to nonprofit organizations, to town or city governments, uh, and uh, sometimes they're being sold uh, to private owners. Uh, and uh, but the ownership is being transferred in, in various ways. So basically, other entities are taking over the management of these lighthouses. And I like to say the preservationists are the new keepers. These nonprofit organizations private owners, uh, town and city governments that own them, and so on and so on. These uh, really are the keepers of the 21st century. Just a few more basics. Uh, before the American Revolution, lighthouses were built and maintained by the individual colonies. It's not going to be a quiz, by the way. You don't have to remember all this. But the uh, first Public Works Act of the first Congress formed a federal lighthouse service on August, August 7th, 1789. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, what is generally referred to as the Lighthouse Service, officially it had different names over the years, but the Lighthouse Service was under the Treasury Department, 1789 to 1910, and then the Commerce Department until 1939, which is when the Coast Guard took over management of lighthouses. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, virtually all the lighthouses in this country are automated by 1990. So I wanna say a little bit more about what lighthouse keepers did uh, and uh, the guy in this picture uh, is a lighthouse service keeper by the name of Fairfield Moore. Uh, and uh, he is wearing the lighthouse service uniform, the civilian lighthouse keeper uniform. So lighthouse keepers uh, from 1789 to 1939 were civilian employees of the federal government. After that, uh, the Coast Guard again managed lighthouses. So he's wearing the old lighthouse service uniform there. Uh, and uh, the lighthouse in these pictures is the famous Nubble Lighthouse in York, Maine. I'm sure probably most of you have seen it. It's one of the most visited and photographed lighthouses in the world, though you don't quite get there. It's on an island a couple of hundred feet offshore. Uh, so you park uh, in a parking lot there in York and look across the water at it. But it's just the perfect uh, postcard view of a lighthouse. Uh, so he was keeper there in the 20s. And in 1928, the government uh, his bosses in the Lighthouse Service asked him to list his duties as a keeper, and this is what he told. This is part of what he wrote down. There was actually quite a bit more, but I, edit, I edited it down. I'm not going to read all this out loud, but most of it has to do with maintaining the light and the fog signal. Uh, and the light at that time was still a kerosene lamp inside a beautiful old glass lens. I am going to talk more about Fresnel lenses in a while. Uh, Nubble Light still has its 19th century Fresnel lens, uh, but it was a kerosene lamp, so that required a lot of care uh, to keep it operating properly. And there was also a fog bell. You see the postcard on the lower right from the early 1900s. That is a fog bell tower near the lighthouse. You can actually see the bronze bell hanging on the side of that. Uh, typically, those were about a thousand pounds. Some of them were larger, uh, but there was a, a clockwork mechanism inside that shed there, and the keeper would go out there every couple of hours or so and wind that up, and weights would rise up as the weights gradually fell. A hammer would strike that bell, what they called a striker, would hit the bell every so many seconds. Mariners would recognize the sound of that bell and the intervals between blows, and that would help tell them where they were in the fog when they couldn't see a thing. So the fog bell was considered every bit as important as the light. Many places had fog horns, steam operated or later uh, air, compressed air operated fog horns, but Nubble had a fog bell uh, right up into the 1960s. Uh, so he had to maintain the all the equipment related to the bell, all the equipment related to the light. He also had had to make sure everything was spick and span, everything had to be perfectly clean, the buildings had to be painted, the grass had to be mowed, basically everything had to be pristine. He never knew when a lighthouse inspector was going to show up and do a white glove inspection and he would be graded on that. Uh, also a lot of paperwork, there were lo daily logs to keep, 
records of purchases and uh, the uh, supplies he bought and everything else. Uh, and uh, weather reports, he had to record all the weather uh, and he had to keep an eye on the buoys and other aids to navigation nearby. I remember uh, a few years ago, a woman said to me, so what was the job of a lighthouse keeper? Did he, did he switch a light on and then go to bed and then switch a light off in the morning? Well, sort of. Uh, the number one thing of being a lighthouse keeper was the light was on sunset to sunrise, but the job was a lot more than switching a light on and off. It was really, you had to be a jack of all trades, basically. So I am going to talk for a little while here about Boston Light, which was the first lighthouse on the North American continent. And for some reason, I'm, my uh, computer is hanging up here a little bit. Hopefully that'll advance in a second. Uh, but Boston Light uh, was established in 1716 as the first lighthouse on the North American continent. And I advanced two by accident there, okay. So here's a map showing its location. It is on a small island called Little Brewster Island uh, in that cluster of islands called the Brewsters in outer Boston Harbor. You can see on the map that it's actually uh, pretty close to the town of Hull on the south shore of Boston. All the shipping traffic for many, many years passed between the town of Hull and Boston Light uh, on Little Brewster Island. Uh, that was the main channel into the harbor. And then they would go between those islands farther in the harbor there. Uh, later on, the channel to the north called the Broad Sound Channel was improved and that became the main channel. And a, another lighthouse, Graves Light, was uh, built at the entrance to that channel in 1905. But for many, many years, Boston Light was the, uh, the prime, primary light leading the way into Boston Harbor. And Boston, of course, had one of the busiest harbors in early America uh, with uh, a lot of trade and shipbuilding and fishing and all kinds of maritime traffic going on by the early 1700s. So the merchants wanted a lighthouse and they got their wish. The uh, General Court of Massachusetts passed the Boston Light Bill in 1716 and they built a 50 foot stone tower on the island uh, went into service in the middle of September of 1716. And this is one of the earliest drawings of it. Uh, the man who was hired to be the very first lighthouse keeper on the continent was George Worthy Lake. He was 43 years old. Uh, he had a farm on Lovell's Island, farther in the harbor. And he moved to the island with his wife and two daughters, actually the two youngest of their five children. Uh, there, was, there was also a family servant who moved there with them and also two slaves. Uh, there was a male slave named Shadwell and a female slave named Dinah. Sadly, we know next to nothing about the slaves. I really, really wish we knew more about them, but not much was recorded about them. So Worthy Lake was paid next to nothing by the uh, colonial government. He had to uh, serve as a harbor pilot for vessels coming into the harbor. He made some extra money for that. He also, for a while, tried having a, uh, having a flock of sheep. Uh, and I believe he sold the wool to make some extra money, but that didn't work out so well because one day at low tide, his flock of sheep, I think it was 59 sheep, wandered out on a sand spit off of the island. And you can guess what happened when the, uh, the tide came in. And I can't hear you all groaning right now, but you probably are. Uh, that was the end of his flock of sheep. And poor, poor Worthy Lake really had miserable luck as a lighthouse keeper, but it, it got much worse than that. Uh, in November of 1718, he went into Boston uh, with his wife and one of their two daughters and the family servant. The main uh, purpose of going into Boston was to pick up his pay. They went in on a Sunday, they attended church and then uh, stayed overnight, picked up his pay on Monday morning. They were traveling back in a sloop, probably similar to the one in this drawing here. They stopped at Lovell's Island where he had his farm. They picked up a family friend. They anchored off of Boston Light. Shadwell, the slave, paddled a canoe out to take the, the landing party to the island. Uh, there was not a storm. There weren't big waves from all accounts. And uh, a, a witness said that they, they, uh, they weren't drunk, basically. He said that they were eating and drinking, but not to excess. But Shadwell paddled the canoe out. They, the six people crowded into the canoe. And as uh, he was paddling back to the island, as the Worthy Lake's other daughter and a friend were watching from the island, the canoe capsized and all six of those people drowned. And this is right at the beginning of our lighthouse history in this country. And uh, it is one of the worst lighthouse tragedies in American history. There was a, uh, an accident on the Great Lakes uh, later where six people died. There was, all, there was a tsunami at a lighthouse in Alaska where five people died. But again, six people died in this 
accident. Uh, and uh, George, Ann, and Ruth Worthy Lake, the keeper and his wife and daughter, are buried in this triple grave in uh, the uh, Copse Hill burying ground in Boston's North End. And you can see the death's heads, you know, the uh, stark uh, symbolism they, they put on the graves at that time, the gravestones. Uh, one interesting positive side note on this story is that uh, this uh, was carved by a young man, this, the grave, uh, the stone cutter who carved the, uh, the, uh, these gravestones uh, subsequently married the Worthy Lake's surviving daughter. So there was uh, something positive out of the whole thing. A couple, a couple of other interesting footnotes. Cotton Mather, the famous minister in Boston, actually preached the sermon at the funeral. And Ben Franklin, who was 12 years old at the time and living in Boston, wrote a poem about it called The Lighthouse Tragedy, very loosely based on what happened. And he sold copies at the age of 12. His brother printed the copies and young Ben Franklin sold copies of The Lighthouse Tragedy on the streets of Boston. Uh, let me go back for a second here because there was one more footnote I want to add to that. The second keeper who went out to Boston Light, his name was Robert Saunders, uh, also drowned. He went out to replace Worthy Lake and just uh, several days later, he and two other men were in a small boat going out to meet a ship coming in and the, then rough seas, the boat capsized and two of the three men drowned, including Saunders. So people started to wonder if the island was cursed. Uh, but generally, if you research the history of any offshore lighthouse, especially one that's been around for uh, hundreds of years, you're going to find some tragedies in there somewhere. Uh, I always tell people lighthouse keeping wasn't as romantic as you think. It was, uh, in many ways, it was a, a wonderful way of life uh, for the right kind of people, but it was also a difficult and very dangerous way of life. So Boston Light was the scene of fighting a couple of times during the revolution, during the time that uh, the, uh, the Boston Harbor was occupied by the British early in the revolution. And in the spring of 1776, the very last thing the British fleet did when they were evacuating the harbor was to set a time charge at Boston Light and they blew up that first lighthouse. And uh, not much was left behind. There was no lighthouse for a few years. It was rebuilt in 1783 by order of Governor John Hancock. And a few years ago, when they did some restoration, they removed all the coatings from the lighthouse and found that the bottom part, approximately uh, like nine to 15 feet going around, not an even height to it, but the lower part of the lighthouse uh, is uh, made of smaller stones that are arranged very differently than the rest of it. So it is believed that the bottom part of the lighthouse is part of the original. 1716 tower. But the 1783 lighthouse is the, the one we still have today. So this is Maurice Babcock. Uh, he was the principal keeper of Boston Light 1926 to 41, veteran of the lighthouse service. He is inside the second order Fresnel lens, uh, put in the lighthouse in 1859 and still in use. I'm using it as my background behind me today. Uh, he's actually inside the lens tinkering with the incandescent oil vapor lamp, the kerosene lamp that was in use at that time, very finicky kind of lamp. Uh, and these lenses, uh, for people who don't know, they were invented in France in 1822 by a, a brilliant young scientist engineer named uh, Augustin Fresnel. And uh, so the lenses are named for him. And they came in sizes from first order being the largest down to sixth order, and there are even some smaller lenses in some places. This one is a second order, Boston Light being a very important uh, seacoast light, got uh, the second to the most powerful type of lens. And it's got this series of what they call bullseye or flash panels. So that lens revolved around the light source. And if you're out in a boat, every time one of those panels passed between you and the light, that created a flash. So there was actually a, a series of uh, distinct flashes that identified Boston Light for people. Um, so they're just, uh, I like to call them beautiful works of functional art. I'll talk a little bit more of them near the end of my talk. Uh, this is, well, let me go back to, to Babcock for a second because I wanted to mention the, the little speech here on the right. There was a historical society gathering on the island in 1934 and they asked Keeper Babcock to make a speech. And this is the entire text of his speech. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not much of an orator, but I enjoy keeping the light burning for the ships coming in and the fog signal sounding. I thank you. End of speech. For him, there was really nothing more to say. That was it. He did his job. He did it well. He did it very well from all accounts. 
and never, like a lot of, like mo most lighthouse keepers, he never saw himself as a hero. Uh, they simply did their job, but they were so devoted uh, to keep those lights and fog signals going no matter what, uh, through hurricanes and storm, all kinds of storms and all kinds of bad conditions, but uh, generally uh, did not sing their own praises, that's for sure. This is Ralph Norwood, who was an assistant to Maurice Babcock for a number of years in the 30s. And then when Babcock retired in 1941 uh, as the last civilian keeper of Boston Light, Ralph Norwood became the head keeper. And he, was, he had actually joined the Coast Guard when they took over in 39. So he became the first Coast Guard keeper of Boston Light. There he is with his wife, Josephine, uh, and on the right with their nine kids. All nine kids were born before Josephine was 30, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and uh, amazingly, she actually lived to be 100 years old. She died not all that many years ago at 100. And the last of the Norwood siblings just passed away uh, a few years ago. I was lucky enough to meet Josephine Norwood and several of the siblings back in 1991. I organized a family reunion for three of the families of Boston Light, and a few of them were there. Uh, the Norwood uh, kids, of course, they weren't kids anymore by that time, but they they told me they loved their life out there. They generally boarded with families on the mainland to go to school during the school year. They would spend the summers at Boston Light, uh, sometimes school vacations, maybe sometimes weekends. But the summers were really the glorious time for them. And they, of course, did a lot of fishing, uh, shell fishing. Um, they would have rowboat races with kids on other islands, and they would sometimes play baseball. I remember uh, Maurice Babcock Jr., who I interviewed, told me about them playing baseball out there, but he said the island was too small, and they would uh, go to Great Brewster Island, the larger island next door, but it was still pretty small, and the ball would go in the water a lot, and the water was out, and the games didn't last very long. But, you know, you made your own fun at these places, and they found plenty of ways to do that. Also, like pie-eating contests with kids on the other islands. They would uh, explore abandoned houses on some of the other islands and the forts and, and things that are in the harbor. There's over 30 islands in Boston Harbor, and it's, uh, there's really a lot to explore there. So they found ways to have fun. They made their own fun. Uh, and uh, I'm going to play you a recording of Ralph Norwood. His grandson... Willie Emerson uh, wrote a book about his family's uh, life at Boston Light. The book is called First Light. It was self-published in the 1980s. And he interviewed his grandfather, Ralph, on audio tape at that time. And so I'm going to play it for you, but the recording's not that great. So I put the words on the screen so you can understand what he was saying. But he was asked to describe the duties of a lighthouse keeper. And this is what he said. And get this to play again. The computer is hanging up a little bit here, but it should play momentarily. Hopefully, <laughs> good old technology. Usually, this plays immediately. All our jobs were doing carpenter work, shingling roof, painting, paint. We had to paint all the buildings, and whitewash the tower, and whitewash the signal house, and, and run the fog signal. And, had to stay awake all night, of course. Somebody had to be awake all night to see that the light didn't go out or had any trouble with it. And if it came in fog, we had to start the fog signal going. Well, it was a working job, just like any other job. So again, just like Babcock, he was very matter of fact about it. You know, he didn't see it as anything special. He was from Maine, by the way, in case you couldn't tell but from his accent. But I, I love the way he says, oh, it was a working job, just like any other job, you know. Uh, just very, very matter of fact about it, but there was a, a lot to do and it was very important and they knew they were saving lives. Uh, the person I'm going to mention later, Connie Small, wife of the lighthouse keeper, once told me that she saw it as a not as a job, but as a calling. And I think a lot of lighthouse keepers saw it that way. Uh, so this is uh, Georgia Norwood, who was the first child born on Little Brewster Island in the history of the light station, born in April of 1932 to Ralph and Josephine Norwood. Uh, and uh, this picture is when she was five years old. When she was due to be born, in April 1932, uh, it appeared that Josephine went into labor. 
her husband Ralph called uh, a doctor from the town of Hull. At the time, there was a storm going on, a very bad storm, and the seas were extremely rough. There were high seas, as, as they say. And this doctor, Walter Sturgis in Hull, got somebody in a boat to take him out. Uh, it was at night, and again, these big waves, and they fought the, the seas to get out to the island. When they got out there, they couldn't land because the sea was just too rough. They had to turn around and go back to Hull. Uh, but in the meantime, it turned out to be false labor. Georgia was not, not born that night. She was born a week later in calm weather. But because the doctor went out there in a storm, it made newspaper headlines, and she was called the storm child. And that caught on uh, for the rest of her life. She was known as the storm child. A novelist uh, named Ruth Carmen uh, heard about it, and she wrote this novel called Storm Child, based loosely based on George's life on the island. In fact, the only true thing is that she was born on the island. If you ever find a copy and read it, it's fun to read, but don't take it as true history. It's all made up, except for her being born there. And the climax of the book has a tidal wave destroying Boston Light. And that let's hope that doesn't happen, that it doesn't come true. But anyway, some people in Hollywood thought this would make a good movie. A screenplay was written based on Storm Child, and Georgia was going to play herself in the movie. And uh, she was uh, played up in the press as the Bay State's own Shirley Temple. The Norwood family appeared on radio shows and so forth. Uh, but the night before she was going to fly out to California to make the movie, uh, little Georgia was crying and she went to her parents and she said, I don't want to go to Hollywood. I want to stay at Boston Light. And they thought better of it. They decided they didn't want her separate her from her family for, for so long a time. And she didn't go and the movie was never made, which I think is kind of sad, but you can completely understand why the family felt that way. Uh, I always wonder what happened to that screenplay. But anyway, I guess they couldn't afford uh, Shirley Temple, so the movie was never made. Jumping ahead quite a few years to the late 1980s, Boston Light was due to be the last lighthouse in the country to be automated and de-staffed. Uh, basically, every other lighthouse in the country was automated by, by 1990, and Boston Light was going to be automated in that year, in 1990. This guy, Dennis Dever, uh, was the Coast Guard officer in charge uh, in the late 80s for a couple of years, and I got to know him because I was living in Winthrop, Mass. at the time, and I, was, uh, I started helping to give tours at Boston Light uh, through the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands. And it was, it was the first lighthouse I got personally involved with, and I just fell in love with the place. And at one point in the summer of 89, I interviewed Dennis Dever at the top of the lighthouse, and I just want to play you just the audio of a brief uh, clip of that interview. So here it is. Uh, it's a nice environment uh, in the evening when the wind's howling, the snow's flying, and the, the sea's roaring against the, the rocks outside your window just to sit there uh, in the living room, maybe read uh, Edgar Allan Poe book or something like that. That's what I enjoy doing. <laughs> so Dennis loved being a lighthouse keeper and he loved, uh, he was in the press a lot as uh, America's last lighthouse keeper. They thought he was going to be the last keeper in the country. And he loved uh, that role. Uh, he enjoyed, a, like he said, a good storm out there. He also enjoyed uh, good ghost stories. And he told me some uh, weird things he experienced out there. And uh, this is not my ghost story lecture, which I believe I have done for the Chelmsford Library in the past. But uh, he said that when he and the other keepers ex experienced strange things out there, they would just blame it on old George, meaning George Worthy, really like that first keeper. I'll just tell you quickly, one of the things he told me is that he would be working in the boathouse. He would have the radio on a rock station, and he said the radio would always change itself to a classical station, and he would change it back. He had like a running battle with the radio. So... You can take that any way you want, but he was sure the place was haunted. As it turned out, Dennis was not the last lighthouse keeper in the country because people felt that if they pulled the, the Coast Guard keepers off of Boston Light, the place might fall to ruin uh, because uh, there wouldn't be anybody living there taking care of it, and there could possibly be vandalism and so forth. So in uh, October 89, legislation was passed, led by Senator Ted Kennedy, to keep a human presence at Boston Light. For a number of years, the Coast Guard kept, uh, continued to have keepers there. The light itself, by the way, was automated in 1998. It, it didn't make the news at the time, but they did finally automate it in 98. Uh, it's on 24 hours a day now. 
Um, but uh, after some more years of having, a co having Coast Guard keepers there, they decided to hire a civilian keeper because they had other things for the Coast Guard personnel to be doing. So about just about 20 years ago now, they hired this woman, Sally Snowman, uh, and she is still the keeper. I believe it's uh, now 20 years. Uh, and she is the only official lighthouse keeper in the United States still employed by the federal government. And she is the first woman keeper in the history of Boston Light. That picture on the left there is quite a few years ago when she was in the Coast Guard Auxiliary before she was keeper next to the lens there, Boston Light. Picture on the right is more recent. She likes to wear those uh, period type dresses like 19th century style dresses that she makes herself and bonnets. She likes to wave a hanky to passing ships. <laughs> so she, she really gets into the role. She does a great job. Her job has changed in recent years. She used to run tours out there, but there haven't been tours for a few years now because of damage to the piers out there in storms. Uh, but she still keeps an eye on the place and uh, supervises volunteers called watchstanders, Coast Guard Auxiliary volunteers. Uh, so there's still, still plenty to do out there. But again, there haven't been tours for a while. Uh, so not the traditional job, but still, still an important position there. And just one more thing I'll mention before I move on is that Boston Light is going to be up for transfer to a new owner. It is still owned by, owned by the Coast Guard at this point. But it has been announced that it will go through the process of under what's called the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, and it'll be offered to a suitable new owner, probably a nonprofit organization, or it could be the National Park Service in this case, uh, through an application process. And uh, we'll have to see what happens with that in the coming years, and we'll have to see whether they still have a uh, resident keeper when that happens. Uh, Boston Light, because the first tower was destroyed by the British in the Revolution, is not the oldest standing lighthouse tower in the country. It is the oldest light station, uh, Boston Light Station, but Sandy Hook Lighthouse in New Jersey is actually the, old, the oldest standing lighthouse tower in the country, built in 1764. And there was fighting there in the Revolution, but it did survive, obviously. Uh, it's another so-called rubble stone tower, just built of the stone they found there around the site. Uh, and uh, still has its active Fresnel lens and is open for tours in the summer. Uh, and that was the uh, lighthouse keeper's house there. So nice place to visit at the end of a long spit on the south side of the entrance to the harbor of New York City. And the last light station to be established uh, before the revolution, uh, the last of 11 light stations uh, before the revolution was Thatcher Island off Rockport, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it has these magnificent twin lights. Um, and originally it had two short lighthouses. They put two lights there because uh, in the early days of lighthouses, they didn't have the greatest technology for making different flashes so the mariners could recognize them. So in seven different cases on the East Coast, they put two lights instead of one to make it easy for the mariners to recognize those two lights. Uh, they put three lights in one place, the so-called Three Sisters of Nosset in uh, East Ham on Cape Cod, the only place in the country where they put three lights. But they put two lights here on Thatcher Island uh, to uh, guide vessels, uh, mainly to guide them past a dangerous area called the Londoners uh, Ledge there. The original towers, as I said, were short. They rebuilt them in 1861, these two beautiful, tall, 124 gra foot granite towers. Uh, that were built of, uh, not of Cape Ann granite, even though Cape Ann granite is used all over the world, is quite famous. They used New Hampshire granite when they rebuilt these lighthouses. And the people of Rockport and Cape Ann wondered, you know, why didn't you use our granite? Why'd you use New Hampshire granite? And the only thing I can figure is they didn't have to pay sales tax on New Hampshire granite. Of course, I can't hear anybody, so I don't know if anybody's laughing, but it is a joke. And uh, I guess they just got a good buy in New Hampshire granite. But these lighthouses had magnificent uh, 10 foot tall first order Fresnel lens, lenses in place uh, for quite a few years. One of them is now on display at the uh, Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. But they are, they are active. One of them is still an active Coast Guard A to navigation. The one closer to us here, the, the, uh, the, the uh, North Light, is uh, maintained by a nonprofit, the Thatcher Island Association today. And actually, the, all the structures now are cared for by that organization. Uh, this is one of my favorite lighthouse keeper pictures. This is George Kieser, who was an assistant 
at Thatcher Island in the early 1900s. Thatcher Island had as many as five keepers at a time. It was someplace where they would uh, kind of train new lighthouse keepers in the lighthouse service before they sent them to, uh, to other stations. They would be at Thatcher Island for maybe a year or so to kind of learn the ropes. They had the two lights to take care of and a powerful steam foghorn. But uh, this is George Keyser, an assistant. In 1901, he had a child born on the island, and the child is the little toddler in back of him there. That is his son, Thatcher Warren Keyser, who is named for the island. And the story goes that when uh, his George Keyser's wife went into labor, he called, uh, well, he didn't call a doctor, but he actually rode his dory to the mainland to get a doctor. And there was a storm going on. There were big waves. You know, this is a, a common theme. So he got to the mainland, he got the doctor, and he fought the waves to get back to the island with the doctor. And they say it took him so long to get back to Thatcher Island that by the time he was approaching the island, little Thatcher was already out on the dock waving to him. I don't know if that's true, but anyway, it's a good story. So this is a, a phrase often used in the French lighthouse service, un fer et paradis, and it means hell and heaven. And it refers to the two extremes of uh, the types of lighthouses and the two extremes of lighthouse life. On fair, uh, a hell lighthouse, on fair lighthouse would be something off on a rock out in the ocean or on a uh, small, very small island. Some lighthouses are actually sunk into the seabed and surrounded by water. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and life at those places was quite difficult and dangerous. Generally, there was no room for a separate keeper's house, so the keepers lived at those lighthouses uh, with other male keepers. They were what sometimes called stag stations, uh, and uh, it could be difficult uh, to get back and forth to these lighthouses, and again, there's often tragedies associated with them. So it was, it was really, uh, an ex ex depending on how isolated they were, it could be a really, really difficult way of life. On the other hand, you had the paradise or heaven, lighthouses, which would be on the mainland or a large island. Boston Light, even though it was on a fairly small island, would be more of a paradise light because you had room for two keepers houses and three families to be living there. And by the way, one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about Boston Light is when you had three families there for a while in the 1930s and 40s, you had as many as 19 kids living on this little island that was like two acres. I meant to mention that, so I wanted to throw that in. Um, but the uh, typical paradise uh, light station would be on the mainland or a large island. You might have a town nearby you could go to easily for supplies. Uh, these places usually had vegetable gardens to help feed the family. They often had animals. They would have cows and chickens and sometimes other animals. Uh, almost like small farms in some cases. And uh, generally keepers lived at those places with their families and often you had multiple families living at them uh, to care for the light and foghorn and so forth. So uh, really two extremes. I mean, life could still be dangerous and certainly it was still hard work at the paradise stations, but it was uh, much safer uh, and uh, less rugged than life at the, uh, the hell stations. So this is probably the most famous uh, lighthouse that I would classify as an unfair lighthouse. And again, I don't know my computer's being a little sluggish more than usual tonight, but this is a video clip I wanna play for you here of Minot's Ledge Light, which is off of uh, Cohasset and Situate, Massachusetts on the South Shore. Uh, and it is 114 foot, oh, let me go back here. It is a 114 foot granite tower built on a submerged ledge that's completely underwater. I mean, the ledge is completely underwater at high tide. You can see the Boston skyline in the distance in this photograph. The film clip that's playing is from the 1950s, I believe, and it was taken by the late historian Edward Rowe Snow, who I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, he took it from a plane. And again, that lighthouse is 114 feet tall. And uh, the, I think the last wave you see in this clip actually goes over the top of it. So usually every year, there's at least, there's one right there, uh, at least one or two storms where, where waves just crash against there and go right over the top. Um, so it's quite a famous lighthouse, but I, before I say more about this tower, I wanna to tell you about the first lighthouse that was built on Minot's Ledge uh, in uh, 1850 went into service in 1850, and this was it. This is the first Minot's Ledge Light. It was built uh, because in the 1840s, uh, an engineer by the name of I.W.P. Lewis 
did a survey of our lighthouses and he said that a lighthouse was needed at Minas Ledge more than anywhere else on the, the, the Atlantic seaboard. There had been many shipwrecks on, in this area called the Cohasset Rocks. Minas Ledge was one of the Cohasset Rocks. There had been uh, dozens of shipwrecks there uh, in the years that preceded that, and uh, some of them with loss of life. So largely because of the uh, rec recommendation of IWP Lewis, uh, funds were appropriated by Congress for a lighthouse but they didn't appropriate nearly enough. People said, if you're going to build a lighthouse on Minot's Ledge, you've got to build a granite tower in the tradition of Eddystone Light in England, Bell Rock Light in Scotland, and some of the other uh, classic uh, granite wave swept towers in the British Isles. But our government was more interested in saving money at that time. So the first Minot's Ledge light was built for only $39,500, which was a lot of money in them, but not nearly enough to build a proper lighthouse at a place like this. They hired an engineer named Captain William Swift to design it. And this is the design he came up with, a 70 foot tower uh, with iron pilings driven into the rock uh, and a two floor apartment for the keepers at the top with the lantern and light on top of that. Uh, and uh, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have been too confident looking at that and taking the job of keeper there. Swift said that it would last for the ages. He said that waves and storms would sweep right through the legs and not do any harm. So the first man hired to be keeper was Isaac Dunham from Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Uh, and incidentally, he was also the first keeper at Nosset Light on Cape Cod and the first keeper at Pembroquid Point Light in Maine. So he was the first lighthouse keeper at three of the most famous lighthouses in New England. Uh, right from the start, he complained that the lighthouse shook uh, and swayed in storms. He said sometimes in storms it would sway two feet in each direction. On April, well, before I uh, tell you about this, I should mention that his son, Isaac Jr., was an assistant keeper, and there was another assistant keeper. So the three men would kind of uh, rotate through. They would have two keepers at the lighthouse at a time and one on shore leave. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was, maybe two weeks on and a week off or something like that, but there would always be two men out at the lighthouse. Uh, and on April 6, 1850, there was a terrible storm. And this is what Isaac Dunham wrote in the keeper's log that day. He said, the wind east blowing very hard with an ugly sea, which makes the light real like a drunken man. I hope God will in mercy still the raging sea or we must perish. God only knows what the end will be. The lighthouse uh, made it through that storm, but uh, he lived. He and the other assistants lived through uh, some more bad storms. And then in October 1850, all three of them resigned at once because they felt that they probably wouldn't live through the storms of winter. And I don't blame them at all. So they all resigned. And then uh, a new keeper was hired. Uh, John Bennett was a veteran of the Royal Navy from England. And uh, when he took the job, he was confident at first. He said, the lighthouse isn't going to fall over. It's fine. Uh, but then he was there for a storm or two, and he changed his mind. And he actually put in an escape route. If you look closely, you can see the rope or hauser or cable that goes from the top of the lighthouse to a rock about 100 feet away. And you can see a keeper riding in a basket there, like a zip line down the, uh, the rope there with a, a waiting boat. The idea was that keepers could escape that way in an emergency. Uh, apparently, they did some practice runs with it, but it was never actually used in an emergency. But uh, in early April 1851, uh, there was a storm that washed away the station's boat. They only had one boat. It was hanging on davits, I think pretty high up on the lighthouse, but the waves washed it away. Uh, and Bennett had to go to Boston to get a new boat. So somebody gave him a ride and he left two young assistant keepers in charge at the lighthouse uh, with no boat. They were both in their 20s. Uh, Joseph Antoine was from Portugal and Joseph Wilson was from England. So they're out there uh, by themselves with no boat. And another storm, a much worse storm came into the area in the middle of April, 1851. Uh, the night of the storm, people on shore in the area situated in Cohasset could see the light flashing through the storm. And somewhere, I think it was a little after midnight, they heard the frantic ringing of the fog bell over and over again, like clang, 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 clang. And it's not clear if the keepers were sounding it as an emergency signal or if the tower was swaying back and forth so fast it was causing the bell to sound over and over. But in any case, 
Uh, soon there was no light, there was no bell, and anybody paying attention knew what had happened. Bennett went to shore about 4 a.m. in Cohasset and saw pieces of the lighthouse washing up on shore and also articles of his own clothing that he had left at the lighthouse. So he knew what had happened. There's an artist depiction of the lighthouse falling over on the night of, uh, or somewhere in the wee hours of the morning on April 17th. And the two young keepers apparently stayed in the tower to the last. They tried to swim for shore. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't make it. The body of one of them was found on an island nearby, and the other one was found on Nantasket Beach in Hull. Uh, so it is among the most famous tragedies in American lighthouse history. This is a note uh, that was dropped in a bottle into the, uh, the ocean by those two young keepers on the night of April 16th, Wednesday night, April 16th. The lighthouse won't stand over tonight. She shakes two feet each way now, Joseph Wilson and Joseph Antoine. And this was found uh, a little bit later by a Gloucester fisherman floating in a bottle. So that's the sad part of the story. And the, uh, but there is a happy part of the story or kind of a triumphant part of the story. And that's that one of the great lighthouses in the world really was built as uh, the second tower on Minot's Ledge. It was built between 1855 and 1860. It was built for more than $300,000, which was a lot of money at that time. And this time they did it right. It was built of 1,079 blocks of Quincy granite, the best granite in the Boston area. And here are a couple of pictures from the, uh, the uh, site called uh, Government Island in Cohasset where they brought the blocks from Quincy after they had been cut. They made sure they fit together properly and then they took them out to the ledge where the lighthouse was being built. And if you look closely, especially in the picture on the right, you can see how the blocks have sort of uh, tabs and notches on them. Uh, the tower, the blocks were dovetailed together. Uh, that's in the tradition of it comes from carpentry dovetailing joints together and that made it much much stronger it's almost like puzzle pieces fitting into each other they're locked in together uh, and they also use very strong mortar they also used iron dowels to uh to hold the the uh, the blocks together and it was really built to last and it has lasted through countless uh terrible storms out there and here's uh, the, the uh, they would uh, hoist the blocks into place at the lighthouse site uh, with a steam derrick. And the workers were required to be good swimmers. They could only work most of the time at, at uh, low tide because the ledge was submerged at high tide. The workers were required to be good swimmers and there was always a lifeguard on duty. And in the five years it took to build the lighthouse, nobody was seriously injured or killed, which is actually, I think, pretty amazing. So it went into service in 1860 and it is regarded as one of the great achievements of American lighthouse building. It's actually an American civil engineering landmark. Uh, and uh, it was really celebrated in uh, national publications and in songs and poems and all kinds of things. This is from a newspaper article showing life at the lighthouse. You can see on the right, uh, one of the keepers rooms there. Uh, so it was not a, not a, it was not fancy living. It was not, nothing, uh, you know, uh, it was very Spartan, uh, but it was certainly a better place to live than that first lighthouse. The, the keepers at this lighthouse, the second one, never felt in danger of their lives. They said that sometimes if waves, when giant waves hit it, it might vibrate a little bit, but it never swayed. They never felt like it was going to fall over. Uh, I read in one place that one of the early keepers quit because he said he couldn't stand round walls anymore. I'm not sure if that's true, but I have read that and it's, uh, it is believable. But uh, for the right kind of guys, this was not, not too bad a life. The keepers' families did not live there with them. Uh, there were two houses built on Government Island in Cohasset. Government Island is actually attached to the mainland. And you can see the drawing towards the upper left of the houses, one of the houses still stands and is used for community events today. So the keepers' families would be there and whatever keeper or keepers were off duty would be there. They would generally assign three or four keepers to the lighthouse and two or three of them would be out there at a time uh, with the others on, on shore leave. In 1894, Minots got probably the most famous lighthouse flash 
in American history. And I would say, as far as I know, probably the most famous lighthouse flash in the world. The government decided that they were going to give every major lighthouse in the country a distinct numeric flash to make it easy to tell them apart. So Minots was one of the first to get a numeric flash, and they gave it a 143. It's not Morse code. It doesn't really stand for anything. It's one flash, pause, four flashes, pause, three flashes. But people almost immediately decided, OK, it stands for I love you, one for I, four for love, and three for you. It doesn't really stand for that, but that's uh, what people like to say. So it became known as the I love you lighthouse or the lover's light. And it became a tradition for uh, couples to sit on the mainland, uh, probably in their cars, whatever, looking out at the lighthouse and uh, became tradition for men to propose to their sweeties within view of Minot's light. And I know for a fact that's still going on today. I talked to somebody not too long ago who, who did that. Uh, so uh, it became uh, quite famous. And these days, if the light malfunctions at all, the Coast Guard is inundated with calls. Uh, in fact, I got a call from a reporter from the Boston Globe some years ago about this because the, the light was malfunctioning and they were doing a story on it uh, because the Coast Guard was getting so many calls. So this is Edward Rowe Snow, and I've mentioned him a couple of times. He was born in Winthrop, Mass. in 1902. He died in 1982. He lived about the first half of his life in Winthrop, just north of Boston, and then uh, the second half of his life in Marshfield on the South Shore. And he was a historian. He wrote about 40 full-length books. He wrote a lot of shorter ones, over 100 in all. And he was always on radio and TV when I was growing up in the Boston area and was just a well-known personality. He wrote about and talked about stories of the sea, about shipwrecks and pirates and maritime storms and just all the, the neat things that make the New England coast so interesting. He, he wrote about other places as well, but New England was really his, his focus, and especially Boston Harbor. One of his books was The Story of Minot's Light, uh, and he took this picture. He was also an excellent photographer. Uh, he was an aerial photographer uh, for the Army during World War II, by the way. Uh, and he took this picture, I think it was in 1941, of a giant wave hitting Minot's Light. But in addition to all the... I forgot that I had that sound clip there. I'll go back to that and play that. I've, I've, I forgot that I had that there. Uh, so I'm going to play you a brief uh, clip of Edward Rowe Snow actually narrating a harbor cruise here in Boston Harbor so you can get an idea of his voice. So let me go ahead and play it. And now we have on our left of port side the oldest lighthouse in all America. Boston Light was lighted for the first time September 14th. 1716 and we are approaching it on the left all the port side it is one of a group of 17 islands which make up the outer bay so of course he's talking about boston light or not minots there but I, I think it's pretty cool to to hear his voice and you hear a, what a dramatic way of speaking he had so he also occasionally brought tours to minots light and this is film from 1940 of him bringing a group, if you can believe it, of 100 people out to Minot's Lighthouse. And uh, you will see men in very fancy suits here and women in dresses going up the ladder here. That, that's Edward Rowe Snow in the white T-shirt there helping people onto the ladder. <laughs> and this is just unbelievable. I, I've seen this so many times, but I, I still can't believe it. Uh, and some of the shots, you can see the Coast Guard keeper up in the doorway helping people in. That ladder goes up about 65 feet from the boat up to the doorway. Uh, and he was the kind of guy who could talk people into doing things they wouldn't normally do. He was also the kind of guy that could talk his way into anywhere. Look at this guy in the really fancy suit there. Uh, he was, I've heard him referred to as the Pied Piper of Boston Harbor. For some years, he had a group called the Harbor Ramblers that would do things like this. I'm not sure if this was an official Harbor's Ram, Ram, Harbor Ramblers trip. So eventually all 100 people get up to the top of the lighthouse there. And uh, I can guarantee that's the biggest group that's ever been at Minot's Lighthouse at one time. But let me move on here. Uh, but wait, there's more. He also on occasion would dive from the lighthouse. 
the picture on the left was in 1930 and well in the 1930s i'm not sure exactly when when he was a relatively young man in his 30s he was very athletic as a young man but i'm going to play you a film clip here uh from 1962 it was on his 60th birthday and uh before I play it, I'll just mention that, you know, if you're going to dive out of that doorway 65 feet up there, you got to know where the ledges are because there's ledges all around the lighthouse and you better land in uh, one of the, the deeper areas. So he knew he knew where to land. And I think he only did it at high tide. But this is in 1962. He told people to get their cameras ready. And then he did this. Watch carefully. And there he goes. And his daughter, Dolly, Dolly Bicknell, uh, is a good, really good friend of mine. And she says that she was inside the doorway that day when he dove out. And she said he did like a Tarzan yell and then he dove. And she said, that's when I knew my father was crazy. <laughs> but she means that in a good way. You know, he was the kind of guy who inspired people. He lived life with a passion. He inspired people like me to get interested in maritime history. He did not inspire me to dive out of a lighthouse. I passed my 60th birthday a few years ago and had no desire to dive out of a lighthouse. So this is the memorial built to those two young keepers who died uh, when the first Minot's light fell over in 1851. You see the tablet there. It says they kept a good light, which is the nicest thing you could say about a lighthouse keeper and the memorial on, on the right uh, with the um, a third order Fresnel lens that was actually used out at the lighthouse for a while. And this is a picture from the blizzard of 1978. This was taken by a, a photographer from the Boston Herald who actually won a Pulitzer Prize for it. And it's a really a classic picture. He wrote a little essay that goes along with it. And he said the plane kept banking back and forth and it was very windy and the plane was vibrating. And he said, just as he snapped the picture, or just after he snapped the picture, he threw up. <laughs> but he said it was all worth it because he got a Pulitzer Prize, so he didn't mind being sick. So I'm going to jump up into uh, Penobscot Bay in Maine. This is Saddleback Ledge Light. It's kind of a smaller version of a granite wave swept lighthouse. It's in East Penobscot Bay. It's, uh, if you know the geography up there at all, it's between Vinyl Haven Island to the west and Isle of Ho to the right, two very large islands. Built in 1839, uh, it's a 43 foot tall tower designed by Alexander Paris, who was a very famous uh, architect. Uh, so it was better built than most lighthouses of that time. But the amazing thing is that the government saw fit to have a keeper living there inside the lighthouse with his family. This is the first keeper, Watson Hopkins, a painting of him, who uh, went there in 1839. The picture on the bottom, that's the earliest known picture of Saddleback, a uh, photograph of Saddleback Ledge Light. And you see a wooden building attached to it. That building wasn't added until later uh, after Hopkins and his family were there. When Hopkins went to live there with his family, it was just the tower. They lived inside the tower. So this is part of a letter he wrote uh, to Congress a few years later. He said he became keeper in December 1839 upon a salary of $450. That was per year. Live with my family in the tower, the only building on the ledge. I'm obliged to bring my water from shore, a distance of seven miles. He had to row a, a dory seven miles to the harbor of Stonington, Maine, uh, each way, a 14 mile round trip to get water from his, for his family, which is astounding. Uh, my family consists of nine persons. He and his wife had six kids when they moved into the lighthouse. His wife had a baby in the lighthouse a short time later. Uh, and a descendant of his contacted me and she said it was a, a family story that right after the baby was born, a boat came out to took the mother and baby to the mainland and somebody dropped the baby in the ocean, but somebody managed to pluck the baby out by her clothes and she was okay. And she lived to be a very prominent uh, person on, on Vinyl Haven Island. But anyway, there was a living room and two chambers in the tower besides a cellar. The iron railing, which was secured to the rock around the tower has been all swept away. Also the privy, which was carried away the first storm after its erection. It's like uh, adding insult to injury. The uh, outhouse was washed away. The windows all leak in storms, et cetera, et cetera. It actually goes on for a while, but I think you get the idea. It's very, very hard to believe. I think it's mind boggling to think that this family of nine lived inside 
uh, three rooms in a basement in this granite tower out on a barren ledge out in the middle of the ocean. But here's the, the kicker uh, to the whole thing. They lived there for 10 years, if you can believe it. Uh, and finally, after 10 years, Hopkins resigned and uh, bought a farm in Vinyl Haven. From the farm, he would have been able to look out and see the lighthouse in the distance. He probably never looked that way again. But uh, I think uh, in those days, lighthouse keeping jobs were very political. It depended on who you knew. You had to know people in power and uh, you know support the right political party to get the really good lighthouse keeping jobs, places like Portland Headlight in Maine, places that are on the mainland and were easy to get to, that kind of thing. I have a feeling that there was there was nobody else waiting for the job at Saddleback Ledge, nobody competing for it. So that's why he stayed there for 10 years. <clears throat> this is another uh, lighthouse you could call a wave swept type lighthouse at the uh, entrance to the West Passage of Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. It's a cast iron tower, often referred to as a spark plug type light, uh, or it's a caisson light, the bottom, the base, the caisson is actually bolted into the rock there. And then the cast iron tower is built on top of that. Uh, only male keepers lived here. It was built in 1884. And I wanna tell you about a story that happened here in 1897, in the summer of 1897 uh, in August. The head keeper was Judson Allen, a veteran of the lighthouse service, and there was a fairly new assistant named Henry Nigren uh, from New York City. And these two guys, for whatever reason, hated each other, and there was a, a running feud going on. One night, uh, a hot night in August of 1897, Alan went up in his bare feet to the lantern room, and it was what lighting the lighthouse at sunset, lighting the light. And suddenly, Nigren appeared in the lantern room and charged at him with a knife. And they wrestled for the knife, and Alan was able to knock the knife out of Nigren's hand. The knife went bouncing down the stairs. Nigren went after it. Alan lowered himself by rope down the side of the lighthouse to get away, got one of the station's two boats and managed to get it into the water and started rowing for his life. Meanwhile, Nigren grabbed a shotgun, fired shots at Alan, was screaming, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to get you, and probably screaming all kinds of other things. He got the, the other boat and got it in the water and started rowing after Alan. Alan got to shore first and ran, still in his bare feet, got to a cornfield and managed to duck into the cornfield. Nigren came looking for him and couldn't find him because he had disappeared into this cornfield. Uh, and uh, Nigren went back out to the lighthouse. Alan went to a local life-saving station, told them what had happened. Two men went out to apprehend Nigren. But they reported that when they got out there, it was after dark, of course, by that time, they reported that Nigren was dancing wildly at the top of the lighthouse and throwing plates and utensils into the, the water. So they very wisely decided to wait till the next day to, to bring him into custody. Uh, I found, I've found a number of newspaper clippings about what happened, but nothing about what happened later, except that he was uh, fired from the lighthouse service. I think that's pretty obvious. But as far as I know, he never went to prison or anything like that, although he probably should have. So this is unusual, uh, but not that unusual. You know, most of the keepers at these places did a great job, but I've run into a few other stories like this where uh, keepers turned against each other at some of these more isolated stations. You know, if you were uh, stationed at a, a place like this with another keeper uh, for a long period of time, you better get along <laughs> or there's going to be trouble. Also, anything like uh, alcoholism or mental illness could certainly be exacerbated by life in a place like this. And I think alcohol may have played a role in that, that incident. So I just want to mention, I'm not going to, whoops, I'm not going to go deeply into it, but Whale Rock Light was destroyed by the hurricane of 1938, the worst hurricane in New England history, September 21st, and there was a lone keeper there at the time, Walter Eberly, 40 years old, he was never found, he had six kids, uh, parts of the lighthouse are still there underwater and just a little bit of the base is left, but this is all that was left after that hurricane. Seven people died at lighthouses in that hurricane on the south coast of New England. About 700 people in all died in that hurricane. So this is our local uh, wave swept lighthouse. I'm here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. This is just uh, pretty close to me, a few miles from here, just over the border in Kittery, Maine, at the mouth of the Piscataqua River at the entrance to Portsmouth Harbor, 70-foot granite tower, kind of a shorter version of Minot's light. 
uh, and uh, it takes a beating in storms. As you can see here, I took this on the so-called Patriot's Day Gale of 2007. The storm we had just before Christmas uh, a couple of weeks ago produced similar waves, although I wasn't able to get out there to take pictures. Uh, and here's a picture I took in March 2018 on a more clear day. Uh, so imagine living inside that tower during storms like that. This guy, Jim Pope, lived there through storms like that. He was there 59 to 62 as a young Coast Guardsman. Uh, he told me that when uh, big waves would hit it like that, he said, you took your bar of soap to the top of the lighthouse, and that was your shower. <laughs> he was a pretty funny guy. And I'm going to play you a clip of him. I interviewed him a couple of years ago at the uh, Kittery Historical and Naval Museum in Kittery, Maine. That is the second order Fresnel lens from Boone Island Lighthouse behind him there. So let me play you a, a clip of uh, Jim Pope here. It would it'd be nice to have a little more room than walking around in a circle for, for four, three or four years, you know, like a, what was it, 16 feet, 18 feet at the most on the inside? And you was always climbing up and down, up and down. Everything was up and down, 70 feet. But you did it. I did it. Well, it seems like you're, you're proud of the... That hey, I've done things nobody will ever do in the world again. That's how I feel. How many guys can say they was a lighthouse keeper? How many guys can run a tugboat for 25 years? Especially on this river. So after his uh, Coast Guard time, he uh, was a tugboat captain out of Portsmouth for quite a few years. He was a great guy. He appeared at a number of our uh, lighthouse events around here. Uh, sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago, but I was very glad I, I got to interview him. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about women lighthouse keepers. I'm getting towards the end here, but um, there were thousands of male keepers in this country. There are also hundreds of women keepers, not nearly as many as the men, but there were uh, really quite a few women keepers. Uh, typically, uh, you know, you if you had a, a male keeper, typically you wanted more than one person in the household to know how to do the job. So often wives or daughters, of course, also sons, would learn how to keep the lights and keep the fog signal in case the keeper was detained away or fell ill or suddenly died or whatever might happen. Uh, so quite a few women learned to do the work that way. And sometimes if the man did die or was incapacitated, a uh, woman at the site who already knew how to do the job would uh, sometimes get the appointment. That's how a lot of these women got to be keepers. One of the most famous uh, women keepers in American history was at this place, Matinicus Rock, which is more than 20 miles off of Midcoast, Maine. And it's a two light station, although one of them has been deactivated and capped, as you can see there, uh, but extremely isolated and a rough place to live. Uh, Samuel Burgess became the keeper there in 1839, and he had a few children, but a couple of them were off, uh, were older and were not living there with them. Abby was the oldest child living on the island with the keeper, and she was uh, 13 when they moved there, and she learned how to take care of those two lights. In January of 1856, her father had to go away to get supplies, and he left young Abby in charge. She was 16 at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And not only was she in charge of the two lights, but she was in charge of her invalid mother, who was sick in bed, and her two younger sisters. So 16-year-old uh, Abby is in charge of all that. They say when her father was leaving, he said, uh, keep the lights burning, Abby. I know I can count on you. And soon after he left, a tremendous storm came into the area. And this is part of a letter she wrote to a friend about the storm. Early in the day, as the tide arose, the sea made a complete breach over the rock, washing every movable thing away. As the tide came, the sea rose higher and higher till the only endurable places were the light towers. If they stood, we were saved. Otherwise, our fate was only too certain. But for some reason, I know not why. I had no misgivings and went on with my work as usual. So uh, she, at the height of the storm, the keeper's house was flooded, and she actually moved her mother and younger sisters up into one of the lighthouse towers on higher ground, and they rode out the storm. Uh, but then there was actually a series of storms and extremely high tides for about three weeks before her father could return. Uh, and Abby, every night during that period, kept the two lights going. They never went out. 
uh, and she took care of her mother and younger sisters, and they were low on food by the time their father got back, uh, but everything was fine. And believe it or not, about a year later, the whole thing kind of replayed itself. It happened again, where her father was detained away through a series of storms. And again, uh, for uh, I believe it was around three weeks again, she kept those two lights going and took care of her, her mother and sisters. And this time they were pretty much completely out of food by the time uh, her father got back. She was uh, written up in national publications, was uh, said to be a, a heroine, and uh, she married a lighthouse keeper, Isaac Grant. Uh, he became the head keeper at Whitehead Light in Penobscot Bay, and Abby became his assistant. Uh, they had a few children, but she died at the age of 53 of a brain disease, and this is part of a letter she wrote to a friend shortly before she died. I wonder if the care of the lighthouse will follow my soul after it has left this worn out body. If I ever have a gravestone, I'd like it to be in the form of a lighthouse or beacon. And that is Edward Rowe Snow on the right there and his distant relative, Wilbert Snow, who was a poet in Connecticut. They had a little aluminum lighthouse made and they had a ceremony. Uh, I think it was 1947. They uh, had a gathering there. They put the lighthouse on Abby's grave. So she got her wish. Uh, she got her lighthouse on her grave, and it's still there today. I took this picture a few years ago in a uh, little village of Spruce Head. And I want to tell you, uh, so many women keepers I could talk about, but I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about Ida Lewis at Lime Rock Light, Newport, Rhode Island. Ida Lewis is probably the most famous lighthouse keeper in American history. Not, the most, not just the most famous woman keeper, but probably the most famous lighthouse keeper, period. This is uh, Lime Rock in Newport Harbor, and it's not much of a lighthouse. If you look closely, you can see where the light is below the flags there, below the American flag. The light is on the side of what was the keeper's house there. It's an inner harbor light. It didn't need to be seen more than a couple of miles. So rather than building a tall lighthouse, they just put the light on the side of the, the keeper's house. And uh, it is now a yacht club. That's why there's decks built onto it there. This is Ida Lewis. Her father, Hosea Lewis, was the first keeper of that light in the mid 1850s. Uh, and Ida, uh, very similar to, to uh, Abby Burgess, about the age of 13, learned to take care of that light. And her father had a stroke and uh, Ida was basically the keeper of that lighthouse for about 56 years, even though she didn't get the official title until she was about 40. Uh, but she was really uh, the keeper of that light for, for over well over 50 years. Uh, and she became quite famous. She became uh, the most, uh, she was recognized as the best dory handler in Newport, which is saying a lot for a maritime town like that. She was very strong, uh, very excellent, you know, expert rower of the, the dory. Uh, and she was also a good swimmer. And in the course of uh, those more than 50 years there at Lime Rock, she rescued at least 18 people from drowning. But it's thought that it was probably more like 30 or so, but she didn't like to brag about it. And she didn't uh, like to talk about her rescues, but it was probably about 30. In 1869, she rescued a couple of uh, soldiers from nearby Fort Adams who were in a sailboat accident. Uh, she went out and hauled them into her dory and got them to safety. Uh, and that became, that made newspapers all over the country and made her famous. She made the cover of Harper's Weekly in 1869. As you can see there, the most popular periodical of the day. The people of Newport in 1869 uh, on the 4th of July gave her that really fancy dory that had mahogany seats and gold-plated fixtures. And they paraded her through the streets of Newport on the 4th of, on the 4th of July parade. So she ended up becoming one of the most famous women in late uh, 19th century America. President Ulysses S. Grant came to visit her he uh, stepped into the water to, to out of his boat and he said, that's all right, I'd get wet up to my armpits to visit Ida Lewis. Susan B. Anthony visited among many other famous people. Uh, they sold Ida Lewis scarves and stores. They wrote songs about her and everything else, but she hated every minute of it. She was very modest and didn't, didn't like all that attention. Um, I think a lot of it was because people were surprised uh, to hear that a woman could do a job they thought of as a man's job and to do it so well. And she actually became the highest paid lighthouse keeper in the country uh, towards the end of her career, uh, which is pretty amazing considering women are still fighting for equal pay. 
She died at 69 in 1911. When she died, they actually named the light after her. They had a huge funeral for her with uh, all the local lighthouse keepers came among hundreds of other people. And again, they named the light after her. They named it Ida Lewis Light. And then later it became the Ida Lewis Yacht Club. So the light is not an aid to navigation anymore, but the staff there still lights it as a tribute to her on summer evenings. And I'm getting near the end here, but I just want to say a little bit more about technology. These beautiful Fresnel lenses, again, I call them works of functional art made of multiple glass prisms that serve to magnify and focus that light into a very powerful beam. This is one of the first order lenses from Thatcher Island. It's on display at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. A lens like this would protect the, project the light out uh, approximately 27 miles out to sea on a clear night. Uh, so uh, they were extremely effective lenses and very important to uh, lighthouse history. This is, I think, the most beautiful lens I've ever seen in person. This is the Umpqua River Light in Oregon. I was out there in 2015, drove uh, up the entire West Coast. And this is underneath that first order lens looking up into it. It's got those alternating ruby red and clear panels. And as that rotates around the light source, it creates an alternating red and white, red and white flash. The flash is beautiful and I just think the lens is incredible. This is Seguin Light in Maine, the only first order lens still in use in Northern New England. And it doesn't rotate or flash, it's just a, what they call a fixed lens, but still quite beautiful and dramatic. Very powerful light at the mouth of the Kennebec River. And this is again, that second order lens at Boston Light, that rotating lens that's still in use there. And I got to spend a night at Boston Light a few years ago by invitation of Sally Snowman. And I was able to take some pictures at night, including that one on the right. <clears throat> and uh, during the, uh, the period of automating these lights, most of them are replaced by what are often referred to as modern optics. On the left here, you've got a rotating arrow beacon type of light. Those have mostly been phased out. In the middle, you've got what's called a VRB25, a rotating acrylic light. There's still some of those in place, but most of those have been phased out. And most offshore lighthouses these days have LED lights, like the one on the right. That's called a VLB44. You can have from one to 10 of those rings, depending on how powerful you want it to be. They're solar powered. They don't require a lot of power. They don't require a lot of attention. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, and uh, they, pre they pretty much run themselves. So that is the coming thing in offshore lighthouses. They produce a colder kind of light rather than the older, warmer lights, uh, but still very bright and they still do the job. Um, probably approximately 10% uh, of our lighthouses still have their classical Fresnel lenses. For instance, in Maine, out of 66 lighthouses, eight of them still have their Fresnel lenses. This is Portsmouth Harbor Light here in New Hampshire, about 15 minutes from my home here. It's in Newcastle next to Portsmouth. It's on a Coast Guard station. You can see the main Coast Guard building in the background there, the wall of old Fort Constitution there, and what was the keeper's house behind the wall. And I started a group that takes care of this lighthouse. I'll say more about that in a second, but uh, this is Elson and Connie Small. They came in the uh, 1946, and he was the last keeper of Portsmouth Harbor Light before the Coast Guard came in and took over the station there. Uh, and uh, he and his wife, Connie, lived at lighthouses in, for 28 years and all. When they came to Portsmouth Harbor Light, it was the first place on the mainland they ever lived and the first place with electricity. So they're thrilled to have electricity for the first time. Uh, Connie, when she was 85 years old, wrote an amazing book called The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife that I recommend very highly about their life at lighthouses. And I interviewed her when she was 96 years old in 1997. And I'm gonna play you a brief clip here of Connie talking about having electricity for the first time. She's talking about how they looked forward to it, but it was also sort of a letdown at the same time. We always look forward to electricity, of course, and the first electricity was when we came to Portsmouth Harbour. Mm -hmm. And of course, he said, well, we go up and light the, the light. So we went up and finally he said, press the button, and I pressed the <laughs> button, and I had no, no more feeling, and I've got to vote it right now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what has happened? What is the reason? Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so I went down to the kitchen, sat down, and began to think about it. What in the world? Why wasn't I? When we look forward to it as a big thing, then I realized we had to give 20 minutes of ourselves to light that light. Mm -hmm. And we had put part of us into it. And that made it something. But just to press a button, that was nothing. <laughs> you see what I mean? And so that's my first. But when I went back and went in the house and saw what I could do, we went on an electric binge and <laughs> bought everything we could electric. So I, I think you'd agree that as we make strides with technology, we sometimes lose things along the way. And with lighthouses, you know, with the automation, electrification, and then automation of lighthouses, we lost having resident keepers of these places taking care of them on a daily basis. So that was a big loss. Uh, but uh, nonprofit groups and other uh, entities, as I was saying, have stepped in to take care of them. We started Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses as a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation in 2001. Uh, the organization has given tours there uh, for more than 20,000 people. And uh, in the last couple of years, it's just been tours by appointment, uh, but we continue to do tours. But I should mention that the walkway, the 80 foot walkway that leads out to the lighthouse was just washed away in the storm we had on December 23rd. So hopefully we're gonna get that rebuilt before next spring so we can have tours this coming season. Uh, so this is my uh, podcast. I do a weekly podcast for the US Lighthouse Society called Lighthearted, like uh, as in people have lighthouses in their hearts. I love doing it. I've done over 200 episodes in about three and a half years. And it's people all over the world involved with lighthouses in one way or another, former keepers, authors, uh, historians, preservationists, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I hope some of you might listen to it. You can hear it with any podcast app or go to news.uslhs.org. And here's some sources you might want to look up. I'm actually going to post a longer list of sources in the chat. And you can download that if you want. And I think uh, Gianna said that that could be emailed to people later too. So I'm going to come out of screen sharing here. I think I've run a little long. I hope we have a few minutes for, for Q&A. Let me come out of screen sharing. Here we go. Hi. Okay, I'm relieved. I see there's still 49 people here. I, when I do these presentations, I was saying to you, Gianna, I can't see anybody, so I don't know if anybody's still still here until I until I end. So, so we do have a couple more minutes. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Jeremy before we wrap up, oh, I see. I see uh, some things in the chat. I'm not seeing it in the chat. In the in the chat, I'm not seeing any questions. So I see in the question and answer section, I'm not sure if you answered this already, Jeremy, but um, are oh, foghorns yeah. still in use? That's right. I've forgotten webinars. That's a separate Q&A section. Um, are foghorns still in use? The answer is yes. Some of them have been discontinued. Uh, the ones that are still used are uh, often referred to as electronic horns. They're automated. They're not as loud as the old air and steam horns. Um, they kind of, you've, I'm sure some of you have heard them. They have different tones. So some of them, one at Portsmouth Harbor Light is like boop, boop. And some are more like boop, boop. You know, they're all different tones and timings, but they're now, uh, Mariner activated. So if you're out in a boat in the fog and you want to hear the horn to help tell you where you are, you get in your VHF radio on the proper channel, push the mic button five times and it turns the horn on. Uh, for it's sometimes a half hour or an hour, uh, and that's how they work now. So uh, you hardly ever hear them anymore, except sometimes in the summer when people are showing off to somebody else what they can do with their VHF radio. But they are still officially used. Some countries have deactivated their light, their foghorns, like Ireland turned off their foghorns. So they're not, they're not as important as they once were. What is your favorite lighthouse in the world? It's hard to name just one, but I will say that I was just speaking of Ireland. I was just in Ireland for the month of July, most of the month of July. There's a lighthouse there called Fastnet off the south coast of Ireland that is so spectacular. And that's right up there at the top of my list at this point. I, as, for beauty, I love Portland Headlight in Maine, 
but I love minus light. It's not the most beautiful, but it's just fascinating. So I love, I love a lot of them for different reasons, but Google Fastnet Lighthouse and look for pictures. It's just incredible. That's F-A-S-T-N-E-T, -E one word, Fastnet. Um, any advice on being a volunteer lighthouse keeper? There are a few organizations that have um, caretakers, usually on a seasonal yearly basis. They'll um, have caretakers living at the places in the summer. Thatcher Island, the Thatcher Island Association or Rockport is one of those. Um, Seguin Light in Maine is another one that does that. Uh, there's a couple of places like that in the Great Lakes. Um, I think Tawas Point Lighthouse in Michigan. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of opportunities like that. East Brother Lighthouse in San Francisco Bay is currently looking for resident uh, keepers. It's a it's a and b So those would be employees. So they're in the, currently in a search for that if you want to apply to for a job out there. But um, the two places that I think of first in New England for that would be Seguin and Maine and Thatcher Island. Um, there's other two, others too. I'm racking my brain, but I, I want to answer the other questions too. But those are some of them. Um, can you stay at any lighthouses? Yes. There's quite a few you can stay at. They're kind of sprinkled around the country and around the world. Uh, in New England, uh, Little River Light, way up the main coast, you can stay at. Um, the um, uh, Rose Island Light in Newport Harbor, uh, Rhode Island, uh, you can stay at. It's a really beautiful place. Um, there's the Lighthouse Inn on Cape Cod, which has uh, been added onto, but the central building is an old lighthouse. Uh, so I could go on, but there's um, my website is newenglandlighthouses.net. I have a list of lighthouses where you can stay. Also, the U.S. Lighthouse Society website at uslhs.org has a list of lighthouses where you can stay. Um, I did a, a Zoom event uh, with about a dozen people from around the world, owners of lighthouses with accommodations. That's available on YouTube. Look, search, go on YouTube and search for the USLHS channel. And you can find that video of uh, lighthouses uh, with accommodations. That was a lot of fun. Um, was a young child in the revolutionary? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Um, Situate Light in Massachusetts, just south of Boston. There are two sisters there uh, who uh, in, uh, it wasn't the revolution, it was the War of 1812. Um, their father was the keeper and they weren't, they weren't small childs, they're ch children. They were uh, young women, both, I think, one in the late teens, one in the early, early 20s. And a British warship came into the harbor. They grabbed their fife and drum. They saw the soldiers coming in small boats off the ship to raid Situate Harbor. They got their fife and drum. They started playing Yankee Doodle. The soldiers heard it thinking the, the American, uh, the local militia was approaching. They hightailed it back to the ship and left Situate Harbor. So those sisters were credited with saving Situate, possibly from being set on fire or whatever. Uh, and there are, uh, I think, several children's books about the Lighthouse Army of Two at Situate Lighthouse. So I think that's what you're referring to there. So I know I, I talk kind of fast there. There's a lot of ground to, to cover. Uh, I hope I answered your questions OK. So I don't know if there's any other questions. And I see it's getting close to 8.30 here, and I think that's when we need to, to wind this down, right? Yeah, so, um, and I, before we kind of wrap everything up, first of all, I do want to thank Jeremy for being here tonight. This was a really great presentation, so always happy to have you here to talk to us about lighthouses. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you to everyone who was able to join in tonight. Um, thank you for all of your lovely comments um, down below here. That's great. Um, I'll make sure that we are able to share um, the resources um, that Jeremy um, was talking about earlier, as well as all of his other information, like his website that he had referenced um, and the podcast as well for you guys to check out. So um, I believe we'll be able to send those in an email to you all. So hopefully you get those at some point tomorrow um, or potentially sometime by the end of this week, Friday, the latest. So keep an eye out on that. Um, but yes. If I could just quickly say, somebody asked a question in the chat rather than yeah. the Q and A. Um, what was the 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 lens with the red and white panels? That was Umpqua, U M P Q U A, Umpqua River Lighthouse in Oregon. Incredible first order lens. So just wanted to get that in. <laughs> and yeah, I just no, posted thanks. the list of sources again. If you want to, you can actually download it from the chat 
or like Gianna just said, it can it will be emailed. Yes, yeah, you won't miss out on that. All right. All right. Well, thank you again, Jeremy. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for, for listening. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.